thankfully. It means I can stay out much later tonight, I guess. Um, but I'm Simon Rosenberg from NDN, and those of you who don't know us, we are uh, a think tank based in Washington, D.C., and our URL is ndn.org. So if there's anything you hear today that excites you, makes you interested, you know, we do all those things that people do these days and live on Facebook and Twitter and have a blog and a website, so it's easy to stay in touch with us. Uh, and I'm very excited about this presentation you're going to hear today from Mike Hayes. I will say his partner in crime, Morley Winograd, uh, is not here. Uh, he was, Morley got sick and wasn't able to make the journey from, from California. And um, so what you're going to see is about, is it about a half an hour, Mike? You yeah, think? about a half hour. About a half an hour presentation. So just fasten your seatbelt, get ready. It's a wonderful presentation about the millennial generation. And what Mike and Morley, if I can have the book, have written a book called Millennial Makeover. Uh, it was called by the New York Times lead book review critic last year, one of the top 10 books in all of 2008, not just political books, but books books. Uh, it's been so we can say that Mike and Morley are critically acclaimed authors uh, who've, and whose book I think has been seen by many people really as a definitional early take uh, about this emerging uh, millennial generation. And just a little bit of background and, uh, on some of the arguments that NDN makes, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and I'll be very brief. You know, our basic argument at NDN is that there's a new politics being born in America. And it's being driven by three changes that are making the politics of the 21st century different from the politics of the 20th. And they are the emergence of a new governing agenda uh, and, and, and challenges both domestically and globally that are different from what we faced in the 20th century. Second is the way that media and technology are changing the way that we communicate and advocate and organize and govern, uh, which is obviously something central to, the, to uh, this conference. And third is that the people of the United States are going through profound change, that who we are as a people are, is that we may, be, we may be going through the most profound demographic change in our history in the U.S. since the arrival of the Europeans here, literally on the soil in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. And we talk a lot about, we, be, we become a leader, I, I'd like to believe, in really helping interpret how the population of the United States is changing and how it's, a, it's changing our, our politics. And so one of the areas that we've been very involved in is um, explaining about the growing impact of the Hispanic electorate in the United States. We've polled more with Latino voters than any organization in politics. We've run more ads in Spanish than any organization in the history of politics other than the RNC, even more than the Obama campaign in 2008. And we have been uh, an early and important explainer of how this rising Hispanic population was going to change politics. And we've done a lot of this in previous Netroots Nations conferences, if you guys have been here. But the other big change, I mean, you can argue that if you're somebody who grew up in 20th century politics and are trying to navigate the 21st, there are two groups, essentially, that didn't exist in the 20th century that are going to be dominant in 21st century American politics. One is Hispanics, um, who will end up becoming 30 percent of the American population, 15 percent today. Hispanic was not a separate category in the census up until 1980. I mean, this is a very recent development. But the other big change is the emergence of the millennial generation. And what we often know in politics is that youth are considered, when we talk about youth politics, what we are really saying is we're consigning uh, youth, you know, kids to the kids' table. That in essence, youth politics is less important than important politics, than the real stuff, right? Winning swing voters and all that other stuff. Not this youth, right? This is the largest generation in the history of the United States. This is a generation that will dominate society, media, culture, politics in the 21st century the way the boomers did in the latter part of the 20th century. And it's literally inconceivable for a political party, an ideological movement, a brand, right, to succeed in 21st century America without getting right with the millennials. And so what you're going to hear about today this isn't about young people and youth and the kids' table. This is about the, the central opportunity and challenge facing all of us uh, as we see the emergence of what will be an extraordinarily potent and powerful generation. And we're lucky to have with us somebody who may be literally the nation's leading expert on this audience in this, in this uh, world, Mike Hayes. Mike, welcome and thank you. Thank you. 
Um, can we can we reduce lights a little bit? Is that do we know? Jesse, can you? Thank you, Simon, and thank all of you for uh, coming here. It's a, a nice a nice attendance, particularly for a Friday afternoon when people probably have other interests at this point in the uh, in the week and in the day. Uh, and I will try to make this brief, but I hope interesting for you uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and to, to fulfill the nice things that Simon said. Um, this picture is, I'm not 100% certain what the government building is, but I know it's, as you can see from the white columns, it is a government building in Washington. I think it's the Capitol, but it may be something else. I'm not sure. Uh, and if you look, you can see there's a lot of people sitting on the columns and so on. And if you also look, they're wearing winter clothes. And that's because it was January 20th, 19, uh, 2009. Uh, and it was millennials mostly, uh, in part because they probably had better metabolism than the rest <laughs> of us and could withstand the cold weather. But in large part because if there was any group that was significantly responsible for the victory of Barack Obama. It was the millennial generation. And so they were there in Washington to celebrate the inauguration of literally their president, just as their great grandparents probably were in Washington in 1933 to celebrate the inauguration of their president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so what we see is that this really in many ways was a millennial victory for uh, Barack Obama for the Democratic Party. This is CNN survey data from uh, 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 exit poll data from last year. And if you go from left to right, you will see gener a huge generational difference. Uh, millennials represented by the blue and the column on the, on the left, two thirds, two to one vote, more than two to one vote in favor of, of uh, now President uh, Barack Obama. The next oldest generation, Gen X, fairly evenly divided, but a slight majority for Obama. The boomers, uh, the, ne the, old, the third oldest generation, uh, divided as they always are, and even split between Obama and, uh, and, and John McCain. And finally, the old folks, uh, which if Morley were here, he would be one, I am another, the silent generation. Morley and I were in that minority of 45%. And the, the, but the majority of our generational compatriots actually voted for John McCain. So, pardon me? He, he is one of us. And, and interestingly enough, Sarah, you're right. Uh, John McCain is a silent. That is the only generation in American history that has never elected a president. Uh, Joe Biden is a, uh, a silent, uh, but it probably the chances are of us seeing a silent president uh, uh, are, 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 are pretty remote at this point. So that generation will recede into history without having elected a president. But if you look at all those three generations on the right and kind of combine them together, essentially it was a, a wash. Uh, I think a very slight majority for Obama, but, but, but really a wash. And so you could really argue that it was the millennials who won the election, at least in a meaningful way, for, for, for Barack Obama. Millennials contributed about 80% of, 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 of President Obama's popular vote majority and turned what really would have been a squeaker into a, into a, a, a solid, the most, as Simon is fond of saying, the most solid Democratic presidential victory since Lyndon Johnson's uh, in 1964. So uh, it, it was a majority solid victory. So it really was a huge generational difference for the millennial generation. But really, in many ways, this was not something that is unpredictable. Morley and I wrote our book uh, in, and turned it in actually on the 4th of July in 2007. And we pretty much predicted that, uh, that uh, not necessarily Barack Obama at that point, but the Democratic Party was going to be in, in pretty solid shape. The reason we were able to do that is because we borrowed from the generational theories of two authors, the late William Strauss and Neil Howe, who actually are not Democrats, but uh, nevertheless are, are two very brilliant uh, a, a, a students of American history, of American sociology. They propose that there are four generational archetypes that rotate or cycle throughout American history and have done so since really pre-colonial period. They actually, in their books, they actually went back to pre-colonial England and talked about 
generations of this type, uh, which, which simply transferred over to uh, over to America when they came came uh, when when the English colonized uh, New England and Virginia and so on. But there were these four generational archetypes that go throughout American history. Each generation. Our, each generational archetype is different from its parents, but like the generational archetype in the next uh, in the next cycle, a generation is roughly 20 years long, so a cycle takes roughly 80 years to complete. The oldest generation in which there are significant numbers of Americans are still a few members of the GI generation uh, left, and in, but in declining numbers. But the oldest generation. Uh, is what is referred to as, they refer to as, a, as the adaptive, a, adaptive type of generation. These generations get to be the way they are because of the way the parents rear them. Uh, it, American society, or at least Anglo-American society, is maybe the, it, it, for a long time the only societal, societal type in the world where people raise their children differently than they were raised themselves. They don't like the way they were reared, and they say, I'm going to do it different, and I'm going to get it better. So the silent generation is the oldest existing generation. You see the dates in which that generation was born. And those dates are very significant because you know what was going on in the world. Uh, and it's actually not all that dissimilar from what's going on right now. But it was the Great Depression followed by World War II. As a result, the silent generation is a relatively small generation. People didn't have as many kids. They had them later and so on. And the kids were raised in a way that was very overprotected and almost smothered. Uh, because people didn't want to bring their kids into the world that way, and when they did bring them into the world, they wanted to protect them very carefully. And so you have people who tend to be risk-averse, conformist, uh, and, and kind of inclined toward compromise as they've grown up. Now, if we illustrated in our book, uh, we use television sitcoms as, in, as kind of a reference point for how different generations tend to be reared. Well, we silence were born before TV. And so there were no TV sitcoms, and so that's that thing in the middle there, that brown object, if some of you don't recognize it, is in fact a radio, and that's, that's what um, I, I, I literally, literally can remember, the first TV coming into the neighborhood when I was about 10 years old. And so I listened to radio before I watched TV. The guy on the left is Will Rogers, that wonderful Democrat uh, from, of, of no organized party. And I will tell you, because nobody will get this right, that group of people on the stairs is kind of typical of, of the sitcoms, radio, uh, drama shows of that era, One Man's Family, which did eventually become a TV show. It didn't last very long because it didn't fit into that era. But that's the first of the type of generations that we're dealing with. The second kind is what Strauss and Howe referred to as an idealist generation. This uh, most recent incarnation of them is, is the baby boomer generation. This generation, you can see the birth dates, but again, born in the great post-World War II high. Uh, America had won the war, had, had, had kind of cured the depression. Uh, country was feeling really good. And so parents felt, well, I don't have to really treat my kids. I don't have to make them uh, rep repress them or guard them or anything. I'm going to let them develop on their own. I'm going to let them find their way in the world, come up with their own beliefs, their own values, their own ideals. So baby boomers as a group, now again, these are generalizations and there may be some individual exceptions, but as a group were indulged as children. They were kind of f allowed to find their own way in the world and they develop these values which they then have tried to use as, they, as adults to try to be driven by those, those deeply held values and try to use the political process to, uh, to, to bring about those values in the political process. So the, I assume most of you might recognize the black and white family on the left, which is the, the, the Cleaver family of Leave it to Beaver fame. Beaver, if you might remember the way he was reared, he was always worried about his father going to clobber him when he made his inevitable mistakes in every single episode. But Ward, that wonderful GI father, never clobbered the kid. And it was usually the response was, well, boys will be boys. I used to do that when I was a kid. Everything turned out just fine. So Beaver was pretty much, and Wally to a somewhat lesser degree, the older brother, kind of find their own way in the world. Uh, as long as they didn't get into too much trouble, it was OK if they kind of acted up a little bit. And as we like to say, what ended up happening is that Beaver morphed into the meathead. 
So that is, of course, as you recognize, Archie Bunker and his nemesis, Michael Stivick, his son-in-law, and really the whole family was his nemesis. I, Archie was this arch conservative. He was, he was a uh, member of the GI generation, and he and Michael would fight about everything. Michael was a boomer, and they would fight about everything, race relations, gender relations, uh, the economy, politics, you name it, they would fight about it. And so that was the first inculcation we all saw of the famous so-called generation gap. We have as big a generation gap now, difference between generations and attitudes, but boomers acted it out, millennials for a variety of reasons don't act it out quite in the same way. The next type of generation that came along was, was in the cycle, the rec a recessive generation, which most recently is, is Generation X. Again, you can see the, 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 the birth dates. Generation X is the children of the pill in, in many ways. It, it was a small generation. Women were going outside of the home for the first time. They were working outside of their homes uh, for a variety of different reasons. And very often kids were left unprotected. They were criticized. People uh, didn't want to have kids. If they had them, they had them late in life. And, and so we had a, the, the, the rise of something called latchkey kids. For the first time, kids actually came home to empty houses. Never had happened before in American history. Suddenly we find these kids coming home. Uh, FaceTime with parents was maybe a half hour a day instead of the usual previous three to four hours a day. It was just a very different thing. And so kids had to learn to fend for themselves, and they did it pretty well, actually. I mean, the generation tended to be alienated, but also risk-taking, entrepreneurial, pragmatic adults. They could find their way in the world. And so on the one hand, you see the Bundy family from uh, Married with Children, where the whole family is at war with one another, and yet the kids somehow managed to muddle through. And they became, as they grew up, the family from France. And that was really the family. The parents of those kids weren't the family. They fought with their parents all the time. Their parents were actually pretty nasty to the kids. But you never knew what jobs these people had. You never knew where their lives were headed. But somehow they managed to muddle through and eventually became the parents of the next generational type. And this is the civic generation. The, origin, the, the, most re, the most recent previous version of this was, of course, the famous GI generation, Tom Brokaw's greatest generation. You can see their birth dates at the very beginnings of the 20th century. And then the millennials from 1982 to 2003. Again, a reaction to the way both Boomer and Gen X kids were reared. So the kids were protected. They were revered. Everybody wanted to have kids when they had kids. And so you had the special kids, the baby on board signs, all of those things that didn't exist before. And the end result of this was kids who became group-oriented problem solvers. They built institutions. Rather than trying to tear them down, they, they wanted to, to build. They wanted to work together to resolve problems. And so um, uh, you, you can see the Keaton family in family ties. Uh, two uh, baby boomer hippie liberals who somehow, surprisingly enough, reared Michael J. Fox, reared Alex P. Keaton, a Reagan, Richard Nixon conservative. And uh, his, his, his sister, who was not at all political, but she was an entrepreneur. She loved buying clothes. She spent all her time at the mall and eventually parlayed that into a business of designing fashion and her own clothing design. Uh, the two younger children were actually the, the millennials of this group, very nice, loved their, loved their parents, loved their siblings, but thought that their siblings were kind of nutty and went their own way. But probably if there was any group that really represented on television the rearing of a millennial family, it was, it was the Huxtables from the Bill Cosby show. Both parents worked in high-powered professional jobs. He was a doctor, as you recall. She was, a, she was a lawyer. And yet they managed to find lots of time for their kids. There were rules for the kids. There were negotiated punishments. The, the kids never left home. That was the running joke in the show that Bill Cosby always wanted to have the house to himself with his wife. But the parents, and I mean the kids and the grandkids, always kept coming back. So we have these four generational archetypes that kind of rotate and revolve throughout American history. But let's talk a little bit about how millennials are reared. Um, there are uh, several characteristics, as you can see, of what all of this produces for millennials. First of all, there's a sense that this generation is special. Uh, you, you notice the baby on board signs, the sense that somehow these kids are special, they're unique, uh, uh, things of this nature. They are sheltered. 
they were protected. They're highly protected. They, we, we, we see TV shows about kids not being able to, uh, you know, about child predators, uh, a child safety movement, kids who go out for stroller rides, wear helmets, things of that nature. Uh, this produces, however, a optimistic, positive generation. This generation, in spite of all the problems it's facing right now, is far more confident about what's going on and its ability to solve problems than other generations. The purple dinosaur, Barney, is actually a crucial element in all of this because millennial children watched Barney. They were sat down in front of the TV said, Barney, purple dinosaur. Totally different, totally unique. What every show was, was this unique, unusual character got together a group of politically correct kids of all genders, races, and so on, and they solved a problem. It wasn't it was a huge problem, but they worked together to solve the problem. And so they, the, the whole notion was, if you work together, you get things done, and, and you will bond with your peers and make things happen. They are the, a high achieving generation. All of the positive indicators, all, I'm sorry, all the negative social indicators like crime, like things of this nature, teenage crime, teenage pregnancy have all gone down, in fact, with this generation over the last several decades. They are uh, highly pressured, however. They are supposed to succeed. They're supposed to work hard. And finally, they're conventional. That doesn't mean conservative, but it does mean they get along with their parents and they get along with societal values. So when you have people saying, well, I don't know why these kids don't go out in the streets and riot, uh, don't go out in the streets and protest in, in opposition to the Iraq war like we did for Vietnam. They were just as opposed. They just changed the president. They found a new president. That's how they tend to work. So this just one example of how millennials are different than other types of generations and how young people are not the same. Simon pointed out that young people, this isn't the, the children's table. Young people are not the same in all generations. Two magazine covers. The one on the left from Time is from 1990. The one on the right is from Newsweek in 2000. Both magazine covers are supposed to represent teenagers, typical kids. But you can see huge differences in those pictures. And that's because they're very different generations. The one on the left is Generation X. And you can see that they're all wearing dark colors. They're all looking away from one another. They don't touch one another. They are, they're, they're, they're all somber looking. The one on the right is millennials. And you can see bright colors, clutching one another, smiling, upbeat, optimistic. So there really are, in just 10 years, the, the image we have of young people, of kids, had totally changed in America. And that's because we have a new generation of young people in America. Millennials are one of the things that characterizes them. We talked about their, their group orientation, is that everybody has a say in millennial life. They all make decisions together. The group, everybody in the group is equal. Leaders try to form consensus. They don't dictate and so on. One of the things that you'll see is that millennials, for example, don't like to follow experts. They don't believe there's such a thing as an expert other than the group. Everybody together is an expert. So one of the things, for example, when you make movie choices, you don't go to see what the movie critic in the local newspaper is saying. You talk to your friends, and your friends say, this is good and this is bad. You get a consensus, and then you decide whether you're going to go see the movie or not. Even if you're going to critics, you'll use something like Rotten Tomatoes, where you'll get 100 critics together who will tell you whether a movie is good or not. They're very group-oriented and very interested in participating in community service. And this is evidence, for one thing, in, in, in community, high school community service participation. The figure in 1984 is high school students and the percentage that participated in community service in that year. In 1984, all of the kids in high school were members of Generation X, and only about a quarter of them participated in community service activities. By, 19, by 2004, when all the kids in high school are millennials, that number had gone up to 80%. And I know some people object and they say, well, yeah, that's because between 1984 and, 19, and 2004, they're requiring people to participate in high school community service activities. They didn't do it then. Possibly that's part of it, but it isn't the whole thing because there really is, when, they're not, when millennials are not being forced to participate, they still participate. This is the percentage of 
those who participate in national volunteer service, things like the Peace Corps, Teacher Corps, things of that nature, the percentage who are made up of 16 to 24 year olds. In 1989, when everybody in, when, when all those people, 16 to 24, were Gen Xers, only about 13% of those in the national service organizations were people 16 to 24. That number had more than doubled by 2006 when all of them were millennials. These are pure volunteers, and the number keeps going up uh, with, with, the, with the signature of the Kennedy National Service Act. It is going to increase even more than it is right now. Millennials, because as Simon mentioned, it's the largest generation in American history. There are about 95 million millennials. It's also the most diverse generation in American history. 40% of millennials are non-white. Uh, about one in five are the children of immigrant, have at least one immigrant parent. They don't sense the racial distinctions and differences that other generations have. This data is from Pew Research Center. The question was asked, I don't have, agree or disagree, I don't have much in common with other races. This is the percentage who completely disagree that they have nothing in common with members of other races. White Gen Xers, only a quarter completely disagree that they have nothing in common. With millennials, that number is 57 percent. In other words, most millennials think they do, in fact, have something in common with members of other races uh, because many of them are mixed race themselves and certainly they have friends that are of other races. They are, this is also in many ways the, the most gender neutral, uh, in many ways a, a female driven or dominant generation. For the first time in American history, a majority of people in college right now and in professional school are in fact women rather than men. And so the question was asked, another few questions, women should return to their traditional roles in society. The number who completely disagree. The oldest people on the left, GIs and silent, only 40% completely disagree with that. So 60% agree to some extent that women should go back to the kitchen essentially. Boomers and silence, it goes up a little bit. But two-thirds of millennials completely disagree that women should return to their traditional roles. If you put those who just disagree to some extent, it's pretty much unanimous. It's about 90, 95 percent who feel that you know, women uh, should not have to, to, to do what they used to do in the past, but what, 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 what they're doing right now in participating in society is just fine. Millennials are, the foreign policy beliefs of millennials are, are, are very interesting. They are not isolationists, they believe in an activist foreign policy, but they also believe that America, very much like Barack Obama does, should not go it alone, cannot afford to go it alone in, Ameri in, in the world. So the question was asked, agree or disagree, peace is best assured through military strength. On the left, you see the number for the overall population. In, 19, in 2002, two-thirds, almost two-thirds of Americans agreed that the best way to ensure peace is through military strength. This year, Almost as many people in older generations still continue to agree with that, but just a little more than a third of millennials agree that the best way to ensure peace is through military strength. Millennials would believe that you talk to people before you start shooting at them and, 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 and try to accomplish it that way. Millennials are much more positive. This is uh, very relevant for the struggles we are going through today, much more positive toward government. A uh, question was asked earlier this year. I'm concerned that government will become too involved in health care. Older generations, nearly half agreed with that. Among millennials, only a third are, too con are concerned about too much government role in, in health care. Uh, government regulation of business does more harm than good. The figure on the left is 1994, the year that Newt Gingrich led the Republicans to control of Congress. Two-thirds of everybody in America agreed that government regulation of business causes harm. Older generations, everybody is less certain about that right now, but still a majority of older people agree with that now, and just barely half of millennials agree that government regulation causes too much harm, more harm than good. Federal government controls too much of our daily lives. You can see the same basic thing. Millennials far less likely to believe that is a problem. Uh, millennials are also very involved in using social networks, using the internet, uh, very relevant for uh, a, a, a conference such as the one we are at right now. And one of the reasons that Barack Obama ended up being so successful was that he was able to dominate the internet pretty much from the beginning uh, to the end of the 2008 campaign. 
This was something called the SIP index, or the Spartan Internet Political Performance Index. It, it's like a TV rating. It tried to measure all of the contacts that people had with the Internet, all of the contacts each of the candidates had. I only used some of the major candidates uh, because they measured this for all the candidates. But you can see right from the very beginning, even in July of 2007, Barack Obama was dominating this even before his name identification was anywhere near anybody else and certainly not as strong as Hillary Clinton's was. And you can see, though, that his SIP score continued to rise throughout the campaign. The, the strongest Republican, by the way, was actually Ron Paul uh, with this, and which, which, which does go to show that the technology, while it's important, is, is, no, is, is not as important as ultimately the message. And, and, and Mr. Paul didn't have the message, certainly to appeal to millennials, but also to, to other people within the, in the public as well. Uh, but you can see that Obama dominated the process. By the time we got to the general election campaign, he had twice, as, twice the television or the uh, internet rating, essentially, all the way through the campaign, as did, uh, as did Senator McCain. McCain caught up a little bit at the end, but still was trailing by two to one by the end of the campaign. So to sum all of this up, where we will find with, the, with this generation and its possibilities of producing a major political realignment, these realignments that occur in American politics every 40 years, and the millennials have a chance of producing this, is first of all, they are the first generation in at least four decades in which the greatest number of people actually call themselves liberal rather than conservative. The term liberal, of course, became very debased over the last 30 or 40 years, got it intermeshed. Not, it, it, it traditionally has meant, uh, if you go way back to Jeffersonian era, freedom and liberty versus governmental control, but in the 1930s became economic liberalism and government and intervention in the economy to, benef to benefit the, 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 the masses. Uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, it became involved with such things as crime, so being soft on crime, soft on communism, things of that nature. That's the, the view people had of liberals. But if you can see now, the number of people who call themselves liberal among millennials is about twice the number who call themselves conservative. Whereas if you look at boomers and even Gen Xers to some degree, there are more conservatives, significantly more conservatives than there are, than there are uh, liberals. Millennials also identify as Democrats right now by a two-to-one margin. This is the party identification of young people starting in 2002. And if you look in 2002, first of all, all of those young people, all of those 18 to 29-year-olds at that point, were members of Generation X, and the two parties were essentially tied in party identification. So anybody who tells you that young people are always liberal and young people are always Democrats and they're going to get conservative and Republican when they grow older, this will tell you quite the opposite. Young people are not always liberal. Sometimes in some generations, some eras, they're liberal and some they're conservative. Sometimes they're Democrat and sometimes they're Republican. But in 19, 2002, the two parties were almost tied. And in fact, there were slightly more Republicans among young people than there were Democrats. By 2004, the Democrats took a very narrow lead. The, the first millennials were starting to get into the electorate and actually became, along with GIs, the only one of only two generations that voted for John Kerry rather than George W. Bush in 2004. But again, it was almost tied. By 2007, among millennials, Democrats had a, a 52 to 30 lead. And by 2008 and into this year, it's, it's, it's closer to two to one Democratic over Republican. And finally, I think just to leave you with this, the importance of this generation and why it is crucial and why the unity and the liberalism of this generation has the potential of really turning America around, as President Clinton said last night, for the next 40 years and to complete another political cycle. Last year, millennials made up 17 percent of, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, only, uh, uh, only half, less than half of millennials were eligible to vote. Only 40 percent of millennials were eligible to vote last year, and they comprised 17 percent of the electorate. Nevertheless, they accounted for 80 percent of Barack Obama's lead. By 2012, about two-thirds of millennials will be eligible to vote, and they will account for about one in four voters will be a millennial 
giving Barack Obama, I think, a pretty significant built-in advantage going into that campaign uh, if, 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 he, if he holds this generation and even can manage to break even with the other generations that are older, he, he will have a pretty significant advantage. Millennials will account for about a quarter of the electorate. By 2016, when presumably Barack Obama will be leaving office, 80% of millennials will be able to vote and 30% of the electorate will be millennial. And finally, by 2020, when essentially the last millennial becomes eligible to vote, they will make up a third, more than a third of the electorate. So it's a crucial group. It is a group that can dominate American politics if they continue to have the unity and the, and the direction that they are going in. The next 40 years could be very good ones for America, very good ones for the Democratic Party, and very good ones for progressives. And with that, I will throw it open to questions. Thank you for your interest. And I will say that Mike and Morley write uh, two to three columns a month uh, on our site. And Mike has now started recently a, a weekly uh, polling column. His background before he was doing all this was as he not only has a PhD in political science and is actually uh, a smart and academic guy, uh, but he uh, also did a lot of market research uh, for Frank Maggot, which is one of the leading market research firms in Hollywood. Uh, so he's got many years of experience in analyzing data and demographics, and he's now writing a weekly column that comes out on Thursdays uh, if you want to stay in touch with this, all of this that you've heard today. So we open it up to all of you. Mike, thank you. Thank you. Far, far away, team. Yes, sir. Well, I, you know, you, you obviously you don't know exactly how events will happen. And, but I would say that, that most social science, most political science research does suggest that once political attitudes are formed in usually in a people, a person's teens or 20s, that they retain those beliefs throughout pretty much their entire lives. I can't speak to every individual, obviously. Some people go in some directions and some people go in others. But I, I, I would first of all argue that, that the, the baby boomer generation of the 1960s wasn't quite as radical and liberal as a generation as I think the image was. You know, President Nixon used to talk about the silent majority. And he was talking about the entire country, not just baby boomers, not just one generation. But he could have been talking about that generation, um, a, a, a really lurid example of it. The Kent State Massacre, which we somehow seem to think is, you know, like the epitome of boomer, uh, boomer liberalism, radicalism, anti-war protests, sadly, the other half of the generation, even though I know you can argue the commanders were not uh, of that nature. So let me just finish, and then I'll, and then I'll go on. So, so I think that if you look at poll data from that era, they were slightly more liberal and democratic boomers than they are now, but it wasn't the two-to-one situation that you see with, 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 the, uh, with, the, with the millennial generation right now. So, I mean, the generation was, in fact, much more divided. And, and it still remains fractured and still remains divided to this day. The whole notion of a gender gap is a baby boomer phenomenon. We didn't see men and women voting differently in, the, in, 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 in previous eras. Uh, it was much more on class lines. Upper class women and men voted Republican. Working class women and men tended to vote Democratic in the in the in in, in, in the aftermath of the of the New Deal, uh, and 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 in fact stayed that way. I think one kind of example that you might have, as I mentioned, the two generations that vote gave John Kerry a majority of their support were in in 2004 were the very first sliver of millennials and the very last sliver of GIs who were still around to vote. So I, I can't say that change will never occur, 
uh, on, on this, and certainly it occurs on an individual basis. But this is of a type of generation that uh, Mr. Strauss and Howe referred to as a civic generation that's marked by its, its beliefs and its attitudes in uni unity, uh, combined action, uh, much more positive attitudes toward government. So uh, I, would, I would think that if, if all these years of, of, of the if that theory works and if a lot of years of political science uh, research work that I that I think this generation is going to be liberal however that term is defined uh, for, the, for the for for the foreseeable future now have again said that this doesn't mean that it's going to last forever um, I, I've just been reading a fascinating book called the political beliefs of Americans which was written uh, after the 1964 election in which the authors are kind of assuming that you know democratic beliefs big D democratic beliefs, liberal beliefs, beliefs in big government, all those things are going to go on forever. The Republicans can never rally and so on. This is cyclical and um, somewhere along the line, I, I, Simon I think will probably still be around when the, when the change comes. He's a little younger than I am. I'm not sure I'm going to see it. But there will, but I mean, I remember the last realignment in 1968 and there will be another one in, in, in 40 odd years and conservatism will reemerge again it, 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 because there will be new generations that will have just, impelled Just them. one point on that is that the, I think it's an opportunity. I mean, I think the way to view this is an extraordinary opportunity. As the president talked about last night, as I talked about it last night in my own brief remarks, is that, uh, you know, we've got a shot here to, we're, we're in a completely different era. I mean, what the president was reflecting on last night was this notion that when he was growing up in politics and governed, it was in a period of conservative ascendancy. There was a whole different set of you know, dynamics playing out in the country. Uh, different generations were alive. And what he, what he was expressing last night was this wistfulness that he couldn't be 25 now, right? And sort of as democratic as the country is now, that he was alive in his political life in a time where the conservatives were very powerful. And what he sees, and I think where he's accurately portraying, is that we have an opportunity just like we drove politics, center left drove the country's politics from the early 1930s up until some point in the 1960s, all the way to some degree up until 1980, right? We have this opportunity now because the generation that's going to dominate politics is with us ideologically. And, and I agree with Mike, by the way, that the sociological data on this is that when a political positioning is imprinted, I mean, when you have this, and, and this is why if Barack succeeds, right? And if he's a successful president, the ability to lock in this generation is sort of with just general warm feelings towards Democrats, catastrophically negative opinions of Republicans. I mean, if you look at the, the Weekly Coast poll, which I use, we use a lot in our own writing, you know, the approval rating of Republicans in Congress among millennials is 3% right now. Three, three. Three. And the question is, who are those three, right? You know, like, <laughs> we need to get them to come and talk to us, right? But it's 3%. It's the, you know, those numbers are outside what should be statistically possible, right? So we're really looking at, I mean, I, I often say that the, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference, right? The, the millennial generation is indifferent to the Republican Party. It doesn't register on their radar screen. It's unimportant. And it could be unimportant for 30 or 40 years. And that's why, in my remarks last night, and what the president was saying, too, is that we have such an extraordinary opportunity now. Because unlike any period that I've been in my entire adult life, because I was a freshman in college, Reagan's first year in office, the country's with us. And they weren't with us for a long time. And, but we have to perform. We have to do right. We have to take advantage of this thing. But man, the opportunity for us is extraordinary. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Sure. 
Well, I, I and Simon, I'm sure we'll 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 comment too. I, I it, it, it's a good analysis. Um, I think it's kind of a mixture of things. Certainly, all of the activities, the things that have been done uh, to stimulate the interest of of, of young people uh, is important uh, and needs to continue. I mean, you, 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 you've got to constantly be reminding people of the stakes that they have in this. It, it, civic generations of, of, of this archetype are more involved in politics. They tend to be more involved in politics than other generational archetypes. So I think there, there still will be a somewhat higher level of participation than you might have had when young, you know, say eight years ago, ten years ago, with young people even in those states. But yeah, you're going to have to you're going to have to work at it. Uh, it. It doesn't happen automatically. I think that it, it's almost a, a, it's like Simon said it's an opportunity. The 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 ground is there, but it needs to be seeded and it needs to be worked. Uh, and 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 there has to be a recognition of what the stakes are and pretty clearly young people recognize that uh, millennials with Barack Obama it, it, the 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 positive attitudes toward participation towards the democrats liberalism generally predated Barack Obama i mean millennials were were already on board as as, as a force before anybody knew about Barack Obama in, in 2006, 2007, polling was showing that when, when Obama, even among millennials, his name identification was, you know, 10 percent, 15 percent, something like that. But it, so it is going to take work, but I, you know, I think this generational type is, is, is going to be more receptive uh, than, than others previously in, in, in the cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah, and let me add, let me just add too because I want to give you um, look. Politics is about an argument that you make using tools to reach an audience. Right, there are three components to it, and the audience is changing uh, in 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 the country. The co the country's changing. The population's changing, and the models we have for running campaigns or for running advocacy efforts or whatever it is. Are, have been accrued and built over time where we had a different audience and had different tools and had a different argument than we have today. And part of what we do at NDN and through the work that we do, and I do an extraordinary number of briefings every year for politicians and groups about changing audiences, changing tools, changing arguments, right? And part of what Netroots Nation is about is that we're, we're, we're creating a new politics together. I mean, the, what, what, if you really sort of want to summarize why we're all here, is that we're on the vanguard of a new political era and a new politics. And it doesn't mean that the way that things used to be have just go away. It just means that we have to lead and we have to show people the way how to do this new politics. And I'll give you an example, a very concrete example of something that I think we've made an extraordinary contribution to, which is this whole effort to reach out to Latinos, right? I mean, we began this effort in 2002, and I see the millennial thing as being a few years behind the Latino effort, right? So I just let me give you one very, I'll do this very briefly. When we started polling, when we did our first poll of Latino voters in 2002, it was the first poll ever done by a progressive or democratic organization of the Latino electorate in the history of the United States. 2002, right? Never been done before, a national poll. We looked and looked and looked and looked and looked, right? And uh, couldn't find it. And so we started talking about the fact that half of all Latino voters today, for example, now speak primarily Spanish. In California, 10% of the electorate you must speak Spanish to if you want to reach them. One out of 10 voters. In Florida, it's 7 or 8%, right? We're now talking about large critical mass of people who need to be spoken to in a second language. And what you saw with Obama in 2008, because Kerry, John Kerry didn't know that Florida and the Southwest existed on a map. They made no significant effort in the Latino community in those regions. Obama clearly made the Southwest and Florida a major priority. And if you look at what happened there, where they used a, mo a new model that had been developed by us and by a few other organizations to put emphasis on the Latino vote, right? A segregated, you know, group of people, right? A, a targeted audience. Hispanic turnout in Nevada went up by 50 percent in one election cycle, because in 2004 we didn't talk to them. We talked to them in 2008. Colorado went over 60 percent, and in New Mexico it was like 40 percent increase, right? One can imagine a similar set of learnings that happens with this audience that happens with millennials. And I think that part of the challenge is that we, and I know this from having um, 
failed to get the Kerry campaign to do this in 2004 with Latinos, despite sort of overwhelming evidence that this was a critical thing, is that it's going to take a few election cycles, I think, for the campaign managers and for the models of these campaigns and advocacy efforts to make this a priority. But certainly you and others in this room who believe and care about this have to be leaders and show the way. I mean, but it's not going to change without, you know, old ways have to be altered and confronted, right? And I think we're going to get there, but I agree with you. I mean, we met with Rock the Vote recently, and Rock the Vote wants to partner with us in some things. And they, one of the reasons is they've said that basically no one in the national progressive left of center firmament in Washington cares about uh, young politics, millennials, understands the significance of what just happened in this last election. So I, my gut is that by 2012, this will be common, integrated, uh, you know, and sort of a, a new play in, the, in an old playbook. But it's, it will happen faster with leadership, and we should expect what's happening in New Jersey and Virginia to happen. That should be the expectation, because it's, it's a new thing. And new things just don't, you don't turn on a switch. You've got to evolve. And so part of what I think we all have to do is do, it's one of the reasons we're doing what we do, right? That Mike and Morley go out running around the country and speak at all these conferences to help those of us in this business understand that this is not the kids' table. This is the central strategic challenge facing left of center politics now. And we better get it right, you know, or we're going to have a lot of, you know, trouble going forward. Right. And I think you've got to keep doing it. I mean, Virginia in 2006, uh, you, you know, obviously with, with the Senate race was, was very tight and very close. I, you could look at any individual group, I suppose, and say they were the ones that put Jim Webb over the top. Um, uh, although maybe George Allen was the one who ultimately put <laughs> J J Jim Webb over the top, but it, 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 his because of Allen and his lack of appeal to uh, various minority groups, to millennials who just thought that this man's racist comments were beyond belief in in, in 2006. But you got to keep the fight going. You can't just assume that what was accomplished in 2006 is going to happen again. Uh, and and so I think millennials have to be told that that the Vict that that John Corzine and uh, Mr. Deeds are are crucial elements. That that it does matter that they are elected, uh, one reelected, one elected governor for the first time. Uh, and and so the, the, the you know the fight has to continue. But I think the the ground is there. It's fertile, more fertile than with other generations. But like anybody else. If they don't see the stakes in it for themselves or for society, then you know they they may not show up. Last, and I know we're talking a lot, but last point on that is the other problem is that traditional advocacy models that we've been using for 40 years are TV dominant, and this is not a generation that responds to television the way that preceding perceiving preceding generations have, and that's why you know look, I mean the Dean campaign in 2003 proved once and for all that this internet thing was a big deal, right? Uh, and, you know, let's just say that there are still, there were still Senate, major Senate campaigns in 2008 that in the early part of the year did not have the ability to take money over their website, right? And this is five years later. And so this is new, we're teaching old dogs new tricks, right? And it's going to take a while, but that's why everyone here in this event has such an incredible opportunity for leadership, right? Because no one is expert at this new politics. The velocity of change is incredibly rapid. You're seeing extraordinary changes in the basic electorate and who the basic audience is, right? You're going to see a 50% increase in millennial share, right? In one, in the first Obama term, right? It's an incredible, yeah, it's, you know, increase. Amazing. I mean, the Latino numbers have, you know, Latinos have increased their share of the American electorate by 50% since 2000, since 2000, right? So, you know, how campaigns are run now using Twitter. I mean, you know, it's interesting. Mike and Morley don't even have Twitter up there as sort of a social networking yeah. tool, right? That's all happened in the last, you know, nine months. And so we're inventing all this as we go along. And, and I think that that's what makes, frankly, being in politics right now so exciting because there's no one expert in this politics that we're conducting now. Look at Gavin Newsom for anyone who's following Gavin Newsom's race, right? He's up to what, 800,000 or something people on Twitter, right? Gavin Newsom's race has already created a new model that is now an evolution from the Obama model. So the Obama model used a year ago is already out of date, right? It's, it's happened that fast. 
And so that's why I would just say the younger people in our business have, you know, they're valuable commodities, right? Because you guys, you know, we're still trying to, us older folk, right? I grew up with three TV channels, right, in the world that I grew up in, um, and no internet. And the big, by the way, the big innovation in the 92 campaign, the new media thing we did in 92 was that I was able to get inbound and outbound fax machines uh, in, <laughs> in headquarters, which meant that we could broadcast fax out and receive faxes, which was like, which the campaign thought I was a genius for that, right? There was, <laughs> and and uh, I didn't want to date Bill Clinton that badly uh, during the whole thing. But so I, I think it's, you know, we got, but I think we should be very encouraged that we have feedback loops and mechanisms now to challenge the old orthodoxy of how campaigns are run in ways that we simply didn't have a few years ago. And, and we'll go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I know. I know. Back to the first question, there was something I want to check with the two of you guys. My understanding of the theory of the generations is that it's not even so much about the politics, but the approach to problem solving and yeah. And, and life, yeah. yeah. So the boomers from left, from far left to far right, all have this idealistic, no compromise, high conflict, high conflict right, style. Right. And the millennials from far left to far right have this very cooperative style. Right. And that's what really makes the difference. You're, you're right. It's the ethos or ethos of, of the generation, the way a generation focuses on the world. So, I mean, you, you can look at, at, at examples of boomer politicians, but it's, you know, the Clintons on the one hand, the Bush, George W. Bush on the other hand, and, 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 and just our, our Newt Gingrich on the other hand, of just people who have these strong beliefs and, they, and, 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 and compromise is very difficult because you really believe that the other side is evil, is wrong. It's, it, it can't be compromised with because you can't compromise with the devil and you just don't do that. Whereas millennials would look at it and say, well, we have a problem and we can get together and maybe we come at it from different angles, but you know, you might have some good ideas I'm, and you're a Republican, I might have some good ideas and I'm a Democrat and we'll all get it together and we'll figure it out and so we will go it's going to take a while but we will go to the, the, the even if you look at congressional voting patterns over the years the we it has not always been as partisan when when Simon when I was growing up and maybe not quite as much with Simon but you would there, the people would argue but they never they don't vote along party lines they they're all I mean, you know you, you can't tell the Democrats from the Republicans and on key issues, you'd find both part, you'd find almost no partisan division. Barry Goldwater, extremely conservative, and Hubert Humphrey could both vote for interstate highways, for example. They were big projects. They were helpful. They were necessary. They were called defense highways because we needed them to take on the communists and be able to get people from and troops from one part of the country to the other. But you know, they didn't find this kind of partisan division. That really, I'm. Sorry to say, it's kind of more of a boomer creation, and someday we will go back into other directions. We have, and John right. and John Kerry, right? Amazingly, on his night of his acceptance speech, right, put all those soldiers out who he fought with in Vietnam. And I had friends of mine who were younger saying, "Why is he doing that? I don't even know what the Vietnam War was." Right? It was like there was no connection. It was a nostalgic look back. I, I want to just pick up one thing you said, and I, anyone who heard the session we did yesterday afternoon, is that I do think what you said is really important, which is a defining characteristic, I think, of the America we're entering, is that we're going through a period where there's a growing intolerance of intolerance. right? And, and I think this is a big issue for us in the center left about how we approach people who also don't agree with us ideologically, not just people who are not like us in our skin color or in our you know, sexual orientation or anything else where I think the left has grown, I think one of the interesting struggles is gonna be for the emerging center left is this issue of the blue dogs, right? And sort of like, are we a party where we can disagree and still be part of a party uh, in the way that we can be racially different and we can have different, you know, we can be men and women and people can be gay and straight, right, whatever it is, right? Because we are intolerant of intolerance, right? We are, that's our party. We, that is, in, being, in to, being tolerant is in many ways the foundational virtue and attribute of the United States, right? It's sort of how we were founded going back to the early 17th century. It was a place fleeing religious persecution, everything else, right? And I think there's going to be this extraordinarily interesting application of this in this in the ideological aspect of center left politics. And can we be a diverse set of believers? Can we have can we believe 
different things or because I it's my own belief that this is an Achilles heel of our family, which is a little bit, which is that we always want unity and we never have it. And what we should be seeking is consensus and not unity, right? That unity is a terrible aspiration for the political party because you can't have it. You, that's not what democracy is about. Democracy is about finding common ground of people who are un, not like one another. Especially, especially yeah. on the progressive side, where we're basically all of us are groups that were picked out by the conservatives. <laughs> right. we are not, you know, yeah. If you're not white, not Christian, not male, yeah. you're not conservative, you're not, you, know, you are not one of them, and all of, all of everybody else got pushed over to the progressive side. So you know, we've largely been defined by what we were not. Well, and it's why this issue about Barack trying to seek compromise with Republicans has been sort of torturous for all of us, right? I mean, this has been a, like, we kind of like it and we think you should do it because we want everybody to be with us, but also don't sell out. You know, it's like, this is this is a going to be a, a fascinating, you know, thing that we're going to have to navigate. It's not going to be all settled. Like, we're not going to have a way of doing this, but it's going to be a constant discussion. That was actually one of the themes of, of President Clinton's speech talk last night was right. this whole notion this isn't it never ends it never ends and it you know it it, it it it's worth doing even if he couldn't accomplish it in 1993 it's worth doing now and and yep. and if the, if the health care bill that we all hope passes it will not be a perfect bill it's not going to solve everything in one fell swoop that maybe we on this side of the aisle still have to accept what we are going to get because it will be better than where we are now and live to fight another day on, on and, and, and improve what is there. A lot of questions. Yes, ma'am, in the yellow, please. Well, um, I, I think in a variety of different places. I mean, obviously, the, the, the governmental programs that, that if, through the, the Kennedy National Service Act, uh, the large increase in the number of, of, of opportunities of slots, which still can't be filled. I mean, there, there, are, I mean, there are more applicants than there are, than there are positions for, for people. And again, you can explain it because of the lousy economy but it, it's in some ways still this possibility of this generation's GI Bill of Rights of, 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 of allowing people to serve and, their, and, 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 and have, have their college education paid for. But I think we'll see it in a variety of ways in the private sector of, uh, we, we, you just see it in, in millennial attitudes. I can't predict exactly every place where it's gonna go, but you see it in the attitudes of this generation, it, 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 of people willing to say, I'm, not, I'm willing not to make as much money to be, but I want to. I want to do, to do good things. I. I mean, obviously, there there are environmental activities that that, that I think we are going to see for this, for this gener uh, that this generation will be uh, involved in. I think uh, education. I think working on, um, you know, volunteerism in, in the schools, things of that nature. Uh, I think you're going to see more people going back into into teaching than might have been the case in the past. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I think if there's a problem that are, we have problems to be dealt with, war and peace issues, I think you're going to see uh, a lot of activity. And millennials are partly because of their own ethnicity, partly because of their, just their attitudes toward, toward uh, people in other cultures and other nations, uh, a lot of activity as well in, 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 in things like the Peace Corps, but other kinds of activities, service activities in other countries solving problems. I, I know people who are in Africa now trying to deal with, with some of those issues and just they're just taking a few years off to be able to do that. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, maybe because, it's a, because I'm a millennial, I'm 15 years old, that I'm taking this advice. <laughs> Why doesn't your generation get it? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I used to say that to my parents, too, by uh, the way. Well, maybe it happens every generation. But it I'm does. Yeah. 
Well, I'll start, and then Simon, you know, who actually has a Washington, a Washington um, exposure. I mean, he's there every day, and he gets to look at, gets to look at it. The ugly thing. That the it ugly is. thing that it is. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, in, in part, I, I honestly do believe that it's, it is generational. Different generations have a different mindset on on dealing with with kinds of, of problems, and the leadership in much of Congress right now in is in fact boomer, and it it, it does tend to have a different mindset on there are right there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things and we just don't compromise on these kinds of uh, on these kinds of key issues uh, and uh, you know and, and in truth from looking at it from the republican perspective i think i think they realize that the game might be up if they don't i mean i i, I when they're talking about obama's waterloo and we hope he fails it isn't only because they don't believe in these ideas they believe that if they that if they succeed, if we do get as as Bill Clinton said yesterday, if we do get the health care reform, people are going to like it. It's going to be a lot better than what we got going for us now. And people will look at it and say, "Gee, this is great. Why didn't we do this 40 years ago? Why didn't we do this 50 years? Why do we waste all this time?" And so, so I, I, I so I, I do think at least it's partly politics. It's partly people with with generation. Partly, I think people do have firm beliefs and just don't believe that we should necessarily compromise. And you're kind of you know, I, I used a line on this is that sometimes, and this is less true now than it was a couple of years ago, but that Democrats had collectively the Stockholm Syndrome, you know, that we were, um, you know, that we were captives of the conservatives for 20 years and like they, they left and the gate got open for the prison and we didn't want to walk out into the sun, you know? And I, and I think we have to learn how to be a majority party again, and and I, and I think that we, because we have, you know, listening to Clinton last night, it was, it was so interesting. I've seen him now speak a few times just in the last couple of months, and he's been saying sort of very similar things, which is this sort of incredible wish that he was, you know, that everything was as cool now as it, you know, when he was, you know, I said this earlier, but I think that, look, I think we are entering a new political age. And if you look at what Mike and Morley have written, is that we're at the beginning of a 30 or 40 year run of opportunity for us, where our imagination, our values will actually prevail in the fight if we are smart and good, pragmatic, stay true to our beliefs, not overly compromise and be clear about who we are and what we believe and be not scared that that will alienate people, right? Because the country is clearly a center left nation. I did an interview with a bunch of reporters today and I said, you know, the biggest bunch of bullshit I've heard this entire year from anybody is this idea that we're still a center-right nation. I mean, there's just, it's just sort of such a farcical argument given that an African-American guy who nobody ever heard of with a funny name, like, has got 53% of the vote, right? I mean, it's sort of, it just defies any kind of statistical analysis. So, I, so look, I, I think that we are, it, what makes, again, this time so exciting is that we're at the beginning of a new political age where the realities of that age have been un, are not yet created and but there are going to be believers in the old politics who still exist in their party and our party right I mean listening to Sessions uh, question Sotomayor felt like we could have taken that and gone back to the 1960s right and it, it the same southern drawl the same kind of intolerant you know you know right not, voice right and the and I think that the point is, is that it, that stuff just doesn't go away, right? I mean, you know, t for those of you who are younger, I mean, Thomas Kuhn, the guy who coined the concept of a paradigm shift, was at, was said in an interview, how do people, what happens to people who believe in the old paradigm, right? And he said, well, they have to die and go away, which was literally his answer, right? I mean, you were nodding your head, right? Is that they don't convert, right? The Republicans who are in Congress right now aren't to become, going to become racially enlightened in the next two years, right? The, the playbook, the politics they grew up in, one was could be overtly intolerant of African Americans and become president of the United States, right? So it was completely possible. They're not going to convert. The really interesting thing, I think, on the Republican side is what happens with the Jindals and the younger you know, Republicans who seem to not really come out of exactly that same you know, mold. Uh, I think a lot of the congressional guys we're seeing on TV Who's the guy with that ridiculous hair part that's uh, on TV all the time? The guy from Wisconsin, what's his name? Ryan. Yeah, is that with the hair, that hair yeah. thing? I mean, he I, to me, he looks like an undertaker, you know, that guy. And he, but he, you know, if he's the best they have, 
guys, man, if we screw this up, we're, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, like, it, they, I mean, let's, you watch these guys on TV, right? They suck. I mean, they're really bad, and they don't make any sense anymore. And they're letting guys like Beck, Beck and Limbaugh and Dobbs and these guys speak for them. You know, we should, we should be coming. I hope everyone comes out of this conference extraordinarily optimistic about what we can do, temporarily bummed out a little bit that the loonies have taken over these town halls, but that's a moment in this in this fight, and I and I think in general we're winning, and, and I think we should be very excited. About it. Right, but I, just one other comment because I think what's kind of interesting about all this is not only the Republicans but our side of the aisle and getting used to doing and looking at the world in a new way. When when we were used to looking at it as we're the minority and it's a conservative nation and you know we can't be very bold because it it just isn't isn't there for us. I, I was looking at this group and thinking, you know, if this were 19, the mid-1960s and this was a group of conservatives and Republicans, we would be having some of the same kinds of discussion. And it would have been, Rockefeller? He's, you know, choice, not an echo. These guys are mushy. They're, they, they, they're, they're, they're like Democrats. They're not really like us. We got to be different. We got to be bold. And, and may, we, we have to have a new way of looking at things. And, and, and they eventually got there. And I think it's sort of in the same way with us. We, we have to be kind of empowered, emboldened to take advantage of the opportunities that, that are in front of us and that we haven't seen for 40 years. We got time for one more. Yes, sir, in the middle there. Well, if Strauss and Howe are correct, and I think they've gone through 400 odd years of American history, these generation, generational archetypes are really repeat themselves. It's cyclical. So the millennials who are going to be rearing children now will be doing it probably very much like the GI generation reared their kids. So you will create, are you a millennial? No, no. Yeah, yeah, he will be. He'll be. He'll be Beaver first, and then I'll be Meathead. Well, the the, the ones right now, yeah, the the, the very youngest, because actually, a generation, any generation is raised by two generations. So, so the the generation that is coming along right now, uh, the the very youngest kids, kids under five or six, are actually will be like the Silent Generation. They. Uh, Sarah used the term homelander. That's the term that tends to be used for that generation. Although I don't think uh, Neil Howe has come up with a name that he's willing to use for it yet. But it will be like the silent generation growing up in very, I mean, the, the reason the term homelander was used was in a reference to 9-11 to and homeland security and all that sort of thing. So growing up in scary times, bad economy, fear of terrorism, and therefore a generation that is going to be almost repressed, be, overprotected. But, and then the, so that's like the, the, the very youngest, oldest millennials who are rearing kids will raise a group of homelanders. But further along the generation will, in fact, it will be GIs raising whatever the next set of idealist boomers will be. So yeah, if, if I don't know whether you're, you're when, you have when you will have children, but when you do have those children, uh, it, it's, there is the possibility that, yeah, you will be raising you know, a, a group of idealist uh, beavers who turn into meatheads. So it means that, they're never, that, means that your kids are never going to talk to you again after right. they're, and ten, they'll, they're 10 and, years and old. And you won't understand it because <laughs> yeah. you probably like your parents. Yeah. And yeah, you, of course, yeah, you're a millennial, yeah, and you yeah, like your parents, yeah. and, and, and I mean, it's sad, but uh, I mean, that's, that ends up, and, uh, you know, uh, Morley would talk about uh, <laughs> his, his comments about how his, his grandkids, how much time they spend with their parents, and, you know, I, I mean, I can remember the chore weekly phone call to my parents, and it was just like, oh, God, do I have to call them, and what am I going to say, and oh, this is going to be awful, and I don't want to argue with them, but I know I'm going to argue with them, and, you know. It just and and they they didn't get it and I didn't get it either. So 
You we know. have we have to wrap up. So I want to just thank uh, Mike and Morley in absentia yeah. for their extraordinary work. Please buy the book. I mean, it's a great yeah, book. It, the, you, it, I will plug. Yeah. It is across the hall there. So if you want to, this is what it looks like. Yeah, so and it's I'll even a, sign a copy for you. Yeah, so. it's a great read uh, and a lot of fun. And and what's neat for us is that recently Alan Solomon, who's the chair of the Corporation for National Service has been uh, given hundreds of these books out to his friends and colleagues and really embraced their argument in a, in a, in a, uh, in a very wonderful way. Mike and Morley were featured speakers at the Corporation for National Service annual uh, service meeting in June in mm -hmm. San Francisco, right? So they're on the circuit uh, a little bit in this, in this space. They've done phenomenal work. You can read their stuff, new stuff that they're writing two to three times a month on our site. So please come back at ndn.org. And uh, thanks, everybody, very much. Don't stay out too late tonight. Thank you for your attention.